Remy Winner has to be a loser in these matches. But that Zhou Yulong has got an ice cool temperament. And these images confirm that Dave Gilbert and Fergal O'Brien is going all the way to the wire. Remember, Fergal trailed 6-3 in this one. He was absolutely shattered after finishing at half two against Tian Peng Fei on Monday night. But he's found his form and his rhythm here. Five-ton Fergal. And it will be the Irishman against the man from Tamworth for a place in tomorrow's draw. Two spots left. I don't think I've ever seen Fergal play quite as well as he's been doing at, in spells this season. We know he won the British Open, and it was a strange one because he only held the, the title for six months because they played the new British Open at the start of the next season, and he won it at the end of the previous. But I, I think that I even these days, he, there's an argument he's a better player now than he's ever been because he was 6-3 down. He was drained yesterday because his match had only finished at 2.30 in the morning of, of yesterday. And here he is. Batteries recharged. We've got another decider. We're going through it all again. And it's great. And Rory McLeod against Hamad Mia. Seven on the spin. Then six in reply for seven six. And then McLeod just edging away. So just to confirm again. Wilson, Bing Chiao, Grace, Shang Kam, and Zhao Yuo Long. Five debutantes. Mia would make it six. It would. And um, when you think that he was 7 0 down, and the fact that he's clawing it back all the time, he's still in there. And we're going to see all these matches to a conclusion. Nobody's going anywhere until these matches are complete. Great that Zhou Yulong has, has qualified with Yan Bing Tao. They've you know, they've grown up together. Those two played in the World Cup, won it for China B. Now they're both playing at the Crucible together. That's wonderful. The, the odd one out in that little trio is is uh, Zhao Jin Tong because he's the other one. He's talented. And he's not quite well. He's not made it here. He lost to Mark Williams on the first in the first round. But he'll be. He's another one to keep an eye on. Six Chinese players in total, Neil. It's pretty good going. So Ding, Marco and Liang from the top 16. And then Zhao Guo Dong, Yan Bing Tiao and Zhu Yuo Long. Now I wonder if that is a record for nationalities outside of England in uh, the last 32 at the Crucible. Well, if you're talking outside England, you, Must be, mustn't it? you then go, let's work this out. You've got six from China. Robertson, Australia makes seven. Belgian with Bracel makes eight. And Siang Kam from Thailand makes nine. So yeah. that's nine players outside Britain and Ireland. No, but I, I didn't mean that. I meant, I wonder if six Chinese players, if we include Marco in that, is the most from one oh, country. Other than England. Other than England. Oh, that okay. includes Scotland and Wales. Yeah, I can't yeah. imagine there's been s six Scottish or six Welsh playing. It may be. I'll look it up, but I don't know that. So it could be that all those Chinese players, now that makes up the, the second highest of any nationality. But I've, that's not in the almanac. I've not even looked, but I'm thinking it must be right up there. And because you've got three in the 16 and three from the qualifiers, it is technically possible we could have a couple of all Chinese derbies in the first round. There used to be an awful lot of Canadians playing at the Crucible. I think we might have had four or five of those one year. Of course, we if if Grimsby was a country, there was three in '85. If it was his own principality up there, but it's not. Matthew Lester's just reminded me, by the way, as uh, as we watch the early exchanges in this frame between McLeod and Mia, he's just reminded me of Fergal's other nickname, the Baby-Faced Assassin. I I don't know. Would would we would we go with Baby-Faced Assassin or Five Ton Fergal after? After the quintet of centuries uh, against um, against Hawkins in in York in December, don't know. But he would uh, you, if he was to qualify, you could discuss that with him. <laughs> See what he comes. We can have a little chat over that and 
What we could do at this point, I reckon, is go and start that decider, shall we? The Fergal and uh, David match. O'Brien and Gilbert. Let's have a look. Fergal has broken off. Yeah, there were a number of Canadians at one point all in the top flight, but I don't know if there's ever been quite as many as the numbers we're speaking about. Well, we had, I mean, you go back to 88, likes of Thorburn playing, Kirk Stevens. Werben, it was in the draw. Chaperone, that's four. I think four is all. That is a good shout. That maybe no other nation has had more than six. Which would surprise you, thinking of the, uh, the home nations, wouldn't it? Well, maybe, I, I was wondering, maybe Scotland. You know, in the years when, for instance, a Marcus Campbell made the 32, if you... You know, would you have had a year where you've had Campbell, Dot, Higgins, Hendry, Maguire? That's five. My, maybe. Maybe Scotland would have had six. Answers on a postcard, please. Either on Facebook Live or on Neil's uh, Twitter account or mine. Hendo's got to have twitchy fingers here. If he's surely, listening. if he's listening, surely he knows the answer. He'll be listening. He'll either be listening or be writing a new play. One of the two. Fergal hasn't qualified. Just a confirmation there from Evan. He's quite right. Fergal hasn't qualified for the Crucible since 2010. Made his debut in 94. Quarter finalist in 2000. He's been there nine times, so I'll double-check that. So I think this would be ten double-figures visits. A lot of life left in this frame, though. Interesting question from Warren Pilkington asking who are the two players to have made a, a 147 at the Crucible but not ever been world champion. I think the answer must be Jimmy White and Ali Carter, isn't it? Off the top of my head. Anyway, we've got both matches on here, so we've got a real split screen scenario taking place. Because there is, the reason we've done this is because there's obviously the chance McLeod might just run out and, and claim this. Although, still at the early stages of that being a possibility. Yeah, I've just double-checked that. Fergal is bidding for a tenth appearance at the Crucible. Thanks to Brandon, who says that uh, in 2011, Maguire, Dot, Hendry, Campbell, Burnett and Higgins all played in the World Championship. So there were six that year, and there's six Chinese, if we include if we include Marco as Chinese, which he is, of course, from Hong Kong, which is a, a part of China nowadays. But, uh, so that's kind of equaled it. So it's a good, it's a good th thing in its own right that China is so well represented in the game. 
some people have, have made the point that you know the Chinese revolution that we always speak about is not happening. Well, it, work it out. It is happening. Six Chinese players at the Crucible this year out of 32. And, well, and arguably, one of the most exciting of all of them has only just turned 17. Absolutely right. And, of course, qualifying away from China, you know, playing, having to uproot and you know, live in another part of the world. Never easy for anybody, especially a youngster. I think the Chinese players are making very good progress. So we can't give you the scores on both simultaneously, so I'll just give you a quick verbal update as to where we are with regards to Rory McLeod on the right-hand side of your screen. That's a break of 20 now for McLeod. Total score of 21. Hamad Mir has 25 on the board. So McLeod is four points behind in that match on the right-hand side. But crucially, he leads in frames 9-7. When he was 7-0 up yesterday in the evening, we certainly thought this match was going to be over very quickly indeed. But Mia, all credit to him, has really settled into this match. And those six frames on the spin got the Highlander rattled. Now, just a few people are making the point, and it's an important one. You mentioned that all the times Fergal has missed out. If he was to lose this frame, it would be the fourth time in seven years that Fergal has missed out on the Crucible in the final frame decider. And I think he lost a re-spot as well one year, didn't he, in the last frame? So, I mean, he's not there yet, but, you know, if he was, it would be very sweet to get there. And it's a good point from everyone that's joining in. I'm pleased. It's, it's nice to get this interaction. Dave Senior asks, will Q School be Facebook live streamed? I'm not sure about that. I think at the moment, it, it actually, believe it or not, from a technological perspective, it takes quite a lot of resources to do this. I think they've been focusing on trying to do the drama and the importance of Judgment Eve and Judgment Day justice before rolling it out. I think there's quite a lot of expense associated with this from a from the point of view of the kit required, but we'll pass that on. John Tollett says, chances of an all-Chinese final with six in the draw. Well, we'll have to wait and see what the draw brings us. We certainly could have a couple of all-Chinese clashes as early as the first round. McLeod is on a total score of 43, break of 42. But remember, before we started showing you this on a split screen, Mia had 25. So... He's not quite there yet. And a costly wobble there. McLeod just a little bit annoyed with himself. You could tell by that flick of the body as he walked away from the table. A nice break of 42. And now Hamad Mir, who's bidding to become the sixth debutant, through to this year's draw and this year's crucible, has a lifeline in this frame. Trails 9-7, remember, overall. Just a bit more information for you, actually, on the uh, nationalities. And while we're not seeing anything absolutely major, because I wouldn't talk, we're allowed to talk over match ball or anything like that, I'm hearing from the US Snooker Association. They've sent me a tweet. and Great to know you're listening and enjoying. They're saying that there were six Canadians in the 84 Championship 
Assuming they mean the final stages. Yeah, Jim White, yes, tick. Marcel Gavro, tick. He was there, Kirk Stevens, that's three. Thorben played Mora, that's a, a double Canadian match, that's five. Bill Werben at six, that's a great shout. There were six that year in 84. But I can tell you that that's been beaten because in 2005, the answer, apart from England, the record is seven. And it was the Scottish. Wow. Maguire. John Higgins. Chris Small. Stephen Hendry. Alan McManus, Drew Henry, who people forget about, was a fine player, and Graham Dot. So outside of England, seven is the record. Thanks for joining in on that. It was just a thought. It shows you one thing, though, doesn't it, going back to 84, how strong Canadian snooker was then and how little we see of it now. A great shame. I know we've got the grinder in tomorrow. That's great news. Cliff Thorman doing the draw with you. Well, you'll be there. We'll be there and in, in, involved in that with the Betfred people. But isn't it a shame that we don't see, you know, many top Canadians? Although, in a way, they've got a Canadian there because, of course, Marco's got joint citizenship apparently, Hong Kong and uh, Canada, where he was brought up. So there's that's their link, which is always nice. But you're right. That is amazing to think that. They had six in the mid-80s out of 32. And now, if you sort of jokingly said that, that the Marco connection was not tenuous, but it's not as strong as having six in the mid-80s, that's for sure. Donal asks, would Fergal be the oldest player if he qualifies? Would he be older than Fred Evo? Older than, what, Fred Davis? Or no, no, it, it, <laughs> in this year's crop. Good shout, don't know. Old, older than Ebton? I'll have to look that up. I thought Peter Ebton was about 45. In 2001, there were seven Scots as well including Billy Snadden, McManus, Marcus Campbell, Hendry, Small, Higgins, Dot. So that's uh, the, the Scots strangler holder on. The game was quite high then. Here we are looking at uh, what's happening on the other game. There is 18 in front from Roy McLeod. Meanwhile, Fergal chips away, stays in this match. Hamad Mir misses a ball by an awfully long way and flukes it on. That's an outlandish fluke. Well, to answer that question, I can't remember now off the top of my head because I'm holding two devices at once. <laughs> Whoever asked me that question about whether Fergal would be the oldest in this year's championship, no. Fergal's 45, Ebton's 46. So you've got a 46-year-old already guaranteed and a 17-year-old. The biggest shock is that the 17-year-olds have been 40-year-old players winning all season, haven't they? The game is not a young man's game anymore, but in certain parts of the world it, it may still prove to be, and it'll be probably China. I mean, there's a wonderful 15-year-old player from Wales called Jackson Page, whose day will maybe come. Not yet, but he's very good. Action Jackson. Yep. It was Mark Williams who coined that one. Tell you what, that fluke that Hamad Mir got was an absolute blinder in this frame. It really was. Extraordinary fluke. And it, it might take him a, f a frame to within a frame of Roy McLeod. It was a screaming fluke. Missed one red and the red that he missed went all around the table and potted the other one. Candidate for fluke of the season? Well, I mean, if it gets him to the crucible, yes. Well, that shot's not very good. He played on the brown, but not on top of it. Meanwhile, Fogel attempts to break the pack. It's gone wrong. 
Just these two matches left then. Stephen Maguire was the first man from this pool to add his name to the 24 others in tomorrow's draw. 10-5, Lee Hang. Then came Graham Dot almost straight away afterwards. 10-8 over Jamie Jones. Then it was Tom Ford's 10-8 victory over Hossan Vefai. And then came... I think Stuart Carrington, 10-7 over Williams. Then Nopon Sankam, 10-8 over Lee Walker. Zhu Yuo Long, 10-9, went all the way against the flamehead assassin Ben Wollaston. And now these two. Two matches. Well, th this shows you the, the extent of the comeback. The match on the left, Dave Gilbert led 6-3. The match on the right, Rory McLeod at one stage. Oh! Unbelievable! You see that brown? Yeah, he's Mac fluking everything. McLeod led. McLeod led seven nil, and then seven two. What a fluke that was! Well, he's had two outrageous flukes now. He's riding his luck. Yes. A couple of questions. Isn't Fergal the only player to ever have made a to have made a century break in his very first frame at the Crucible? I think that's yes. And the other one was that uh, is Murphy still only the third qualifier to win the world title? Second, I think. Griffin, 79. Murphy in 2005. No one else has done it yet. Now, look at this. He's going for this. This is... Goodness, what a shot this would be. He's missed it by an absolute mile, but ho attention all pockets. Well, that maybe was one too many. Now, Roy McLeod... And it's blue and pink, and he's been awarded a gift here. Because that really was a... What a shot he's tried there. He was absolutely miles away with that blue, wasn't he? He was closer to a few other pockets than the one he intended. Hamad Mee has played really well in this tournament. I mean, he's 5 nil down against Walden. He was 7-0 down here. All credit to him. And unless Roy misses this, which I don't think he will, although it's not straight... He might have played his last shot. Congratulations on what you've achieved, Hamad Mir. But it might be the end of the road. <coughs> it is the end of the road. Roy McLeod wins. And he's through and he's at the Crucible again. Handshakes all round. Roy McLeod will be with us shortly, no doubt. And meanwhile, we've still got this thrilling... O'Brien Gilbert match to a conclusion. So there will only be five. I say only. It's a great tally, having only had one last year. Five debutants. Then the sixth could have been Hamad Mir. He rode his luck with a couple of outrageous flukes uh, in that frame. The second of which was that brown that uh, bounced around the bottom right-hand pocket, but he went. He lashed out on that last blue, and Rory McLeod at last getting over the line 10-7, having led 7-0 earlier on yesterday. And we will be hearing from Rory McLeod quite soon. Made his debut back in 09. Made the last 16 in 2011. Beat Rick Ricky Walden and then lost to John Higgins. Just one more thing I want to say here. E. Jones, who is wildy, who writes some interesting stuff on Twitter, saying that Rory McLeod is older than Fergal. Rory's 46, so that's another... We didn't, I didn't think we didn't really think of, of Rory being of that age, did we? He's, he's in good shape, isn't he? So he must be the oldest player for a while to make it through to the 32. I know if you go back to the old days, you get 60s and 70s, whatever, but they since Steve made the quarters in 2010, perhaps? Well, that's very possible. And uh, Roy actually is walking into the studio, so we'll be hearing from him soon. And uh, in the meantime, this is at a very tense stage of proceedings. So, not a great deal in things here. Let's 
Seven reds on the table. O'Brien 13 in front. And I think quite a lot of snooker still to be played in this deciding frame. All to play for 9 all. But for the meantime, Roy McLeod's alongside Rob Walker. Well, Rory McLeod is delighted to have got over the line there against uh, Hamad Mir. And Rory, it was, it was a funny match, really, because uh, late on in, in the day yesterday, Neil Foles and I were talking about the fact that at 7-0, it was looking as though you, you were only going to have to come back today and win one frame. And then from 7-0, he wins six on the spin, and all of a sudden, you're in a really tight match. That's what the difference a day makes. <laughs> you know, one day, you, you, you know, you're flying and things were going your way. The next day, you just, you know, you can't make eight. And it was, it was tough out there today, you know. I mean, he started to play well. He was queuing well. You know, he had a bit more of the run of the balls today. I mean, I, I probably had it a little bit more yesterday. Um, but, you know, he had the run of the balls and he was playing well. And that was what I was doing yesterday, so. But how important was it then for you, ha having sat so long on seven frames, to finally move up to eight and, and just get a toehold back in the match when it appeared to be slipping away a little bit. It was unbelievable. And it was just what I needed at the time as well because, you know, I was just feeling like, am I going to win a frame today? So, you know, I'm just so happy that, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm so happy that I just managed to get a frame and that just put him out of, you know, the role. So, yeah, it was, it was tough. I remember when you made your debut back in 2009, Neil and I have been talking in the commentary box about what a great reception all the debutants get. You know, have there been times when, you know, in the last season or so, you thought, you know, OK, my couple of appearances at the Crucible are going to be it. Did you start to doubt whether, whether you'd get back again? No, I never doubted it. I mean, the last three World Championships, I've lost two first rounds and I won one match last year. And... Um, you know, to be honest, I, I was under the weather the last three. I feel a little bit better this time. Um, we're just really trying to prepare for this World Championships and trying to do my best this time, you know? So, yeah. No, I never thought I weren't going to make it again. It's interesting. When, when you look at what's happened this season, the likes of Mark King, who I think is 43 or 42 or 44, winning his first ranking title, and here you are, you know, you're, you've made it, 46, and... Edden's made it, and I think he's 46 or 45. Yeah, older than me, yeah. You guys are, mm. you know, you guys are still able to make it in your mid 40s. Where, where 10 or 15 years ago, the thinking was that you got to 32, 33, and your best days were behind you. Yeah, age is just a number, isn't it? It depends how you look after yourself and take care of yourself. So you know, I've never, I've never doubted my snooker. Um, you know, everybody's following me actually because I was the one who won the. Um, I won the Raw Open Championships, and then Mark won and Anthony won, you know, and we're all 40 plus first timers, so yeah, I'm setting the standard here. You are, still going strong. Any preference tomorrow at 10 o'clock when we do the live draw? I don't care, I'm just happy that I'm in the draw, so it doesn't matter to me. And will you get a buzz? I mean, okay, it might not be quite as big as the one you got in 2009 when you stepped out there for the first time, but... Will you feel that excitement when you're waiting in the wings to set foot on that brown carpet again? Yeah, of course. Anybody gets, everybody gets a buzz at the World Championships, at the Crucible. I mean, you know, everybody wants to end their season at the Crucible. So, you know, I'm just so happy that I'm fortunate to be in this position. Well, you've come through three tough matches, so many congratulations. You are the 31st player in the draw tomorrow. Your name will be called out at some stage tomorrow morning, so congratulations. Well done, Rory. I hope, uh, hope you get some good kip tonight, and we'll Thank see you, you in the first round. So, 31 in the hat. Will it be Fergal O'Brien or Dave Gilbert to join all the rest? And it's almost rather fitting after two days of incredible drama. This afternoon finished with a decider that went all the way to the black between Ebden and Michael Holt. Is this one also going all the way to the very last ball? Neil, what do you reckon? Well, I think it might. It's got that feel about it. We've seen it all before. It doesn't always work out that way. But there could be a possibility of that. I've been getting some tremendous tweets in. And the question I set, I didn't realise it was going to cause so much interest.
but I go back to the answer outside of English players. I've got a new answer. 1990 Welsh players as follows. Terry Griffiths, one. Tony Chappell, two. And there's loads in the bottom half of the draw. Wayne Jones, three. Darren Morgan, four. Steve Newbury, five. Cliff Wilson, six. Doug Mountjoy, seven. Mark Bennett, eight. Eight Welshmen that year. And we've only got one this year. Bit of a shame, isn't it? BBC Wales usually have uh, quite a uh, quite a presence here, but uh, it will all hinge on um, Ryan Day for them. And uh, the other element that's causing intrigue here, I, and I'm not sure whether these guys are, are counting each home nation as an individual country. Sam Davis says seven nationalities already represented, possibly eight. If Fergal wins, is that the most ever? Well, no, 11 is the most. Aaron Graham, the draw tomorrow, big boy, is 10 o'clock. Uh, yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got China, 6. Australia, China, Australia. Belgium. Thailand. Possibly Ireland if uh, if Fergal wins, and then one Welsh, a whole host of English, and Scotland. very good representation from Scotland. North, Northern Ireland, have we said? Yes. Mark Allen. Yeah, the the record is in '92. There was 11 different nations. John, look that up. I think I did look it up the other day. And. Uh, Only waffling a bit here because we're at a very cagey stage of this. So we had obviously Parrot, Eddie Chelton, he was the Irish, uh, beg your pardon, the Australian representation there. Dennis Taylor, Northern Ireland was one. McManus of Scotland, of course. A few, quite a few English players in there, but Canadian Jim White, also Canadian Alan Robidoux. Maltese, Tony Drago. Much missed on the tour these days, Drago. would like to see him come back. Great character, Drago. Peter Francisco, South African. France. Francisco, wow, there's a name from the past. Obviously Bob Chaperon, a Canadian there. And Dino Kane, another one who's missed on the tour from the only New Zealander ever to play at the Crucible. And James Watana, one who's still on the tour now uh, with a concessionary card, which I don't know if it's his second year, whether he, we see the end of Watana or what happens to him. Well, that was a difficult shot that he's missed. He hit the far jaw and he needs a little bit of luck here. He hasn't necessarily had it. A few people saying uh, some appreciative things about the fact that we've tried to give it a bit of energy over the last couple of days. Well... The 32 players who've contested Judgment Day and Judgment Eve deserve a bit of welly and a bit of enthusiasm because the prize is huge. I think anybody who cares about snooker recognises it's a massive stage, a massive opportunity, but that they're under enormous pressure. It's a really enjoyable couple of days covering these matches. They're long, but, but very enjoyable. Yeah, and I think, we, you know, this is another match where you, you know it, w what's happening here. We're in a decider and there's always the, the real possibility that it's going to finish very edgily. And as I said earlier, y you're pleased for the winners. Rob only gets to speak to the, the winners of these matches. And I know that's uplifting in itself because you're speaking to some really happy people. But, uh, of course, for everyone that wins, there's an, a very disappointed loser. And there's been some disappointments this week, of course. Yeah, and by the way, don't don't think I've got it all easy because one of my roles uh, from Saturday onwards is I help out the BBC with the live post-match interviews, what they call the flash interviews, the ones where they immediately come off the table. You do loads of those uh, for ITV and Eurosport, and I tend to get thrown the hand grenades, and I tend to have to do the losing interviews. 
So I, I enjoy the fact that I only have to do the winners over this couple of days because there'll be a few where I'm wincing at the prospect of having to doorstep someone when their dreams of world championship glory have crashed around their ears. But if you ask questions, you've got to be big enough and ugly enough to ask the hard ones as well as the easy ones. Yes, and the problem there is that we see it a lot in all sport um, that sometimes you know they they do get asked doorstepping with the right expression. You get asked the question straight after the match, and sometimes if you could have ten minutes to to, to cool down, you might come up with a different answer. We've all been down that road, but that's the way the world works. That's the way sport works, isn't it? People want a reaction, and that's it. I tell you what I'm not a fan of, and I'll be totally honest about this, is, is asking people questions seconds before a match begins. I, I just think, you know, I love running. It's my number one passion in terms of being an active competitor in something. I couldn't think of anything worse than someone trying to ask me a question ahead of a 10K or anything. I've got my head completely in the task in hand, and I'm not going to come out with anything sensible. So... I'm glad I don't have to do that. Shove a microphone in someone's face just ahead of a, a big match. I understand the TV's need to, you know, to to, to have a, a, an insight into the drama. But I think when a professional sportsman or woman is getting ready for the heat of battle, they, they should be left alone to concentrate in those crucial last two or three minutes before their discipline begins. To, on the nationalities, one more thing. A question has been asked to me the uh, year with the fewest nationalities. Edward had asked that. Well, I guess to cheat is probably right at the beginning because there's only 16 players at the Crucible in uh, 77. And uh, Perry Manns was one of those overseas. So it was uh, Cliff Thorburn and Eddie Charlton were there, Australia and, and Canada in reverse order. That maybe that was the year. I don't know. What I like about the 40 years of the World Championships in the modern era at the Crucible is all these records are now really building up, aren't they? And there's the wonderful almanac that Chris Downer has, has done, which I've got a copy of, which has got all that information. And, you know, it's a bit like the Wisdom Cricketers Almanac, which is a big thing in cricket, where, uh, you know, after so much time, all these stats actually have some importance, don't they? Because they're collated over a period of time which means that most stats are accurate and when records are broken, they're records that have stood for some period of time. It's, it's all good, isn't it? It's all good. It's all part of the history of the game. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's why, you know, all of us who care about snooker were so delighted that the big man, Barry Hearn, came out and said, right, OK, unequivocally, we're not going for 10 years. It was quite funny, actually. I can't remember if you were in that press conference, Neil, because he said, in his own inimitable style, with a few more choice words than I can use here with a microphone in front of me, uh, he was basically saying, I am rather fed up of continually being asked whether the World Championship is leaving Sheffield. We're signing for 10 years. And it was really funny because with a glint in his eye, he said, and do you know what? I'll either be dead or gaga after that, and it won't be my problem. So if it does go, it won't happen under my tenure. So can you all, and I'll use the term, sod off and stop asking me about it. For 10 years, we're staying put. And there was a, a little ripple of applause around the uh, the press room when, uh, when he confirmed that one. So whilst uh, Barry Hearn is at the helm, the snooker's staying here in Sheffield, and uh, all of us in the press room... I think, well, probably apart from maybe one or two Chinese uh, press who might have wanted it to go over there, almost everyone in the press room was delighted when he made that announcement. Ten past ten here, local time. I made a prediction we'd be finished by about 11. So I might not be too far away. Dave Gilbert. Let's just remind you of their 
respective crucible stats then. Only 14 points separating me, and there's, there's a lot of life left in this frame. So Fergal's debut was in 1994. His best performance was reaching the quarters in 2000. And he hasn't made it, despite a couple of 10-9 thrillers in the last qualifying round over the last few years. He hasn't made it since 2010. Dave Gilbert made his debut in 2007. In 2012, he beat uh, Martin Gould 10-8 and then lost to Neil Robertson 13-9 in the last 16. And he was knocked out in the first round three years ago in 2014 and last year. And if you remember last year, I think he lost to Ronnie 10-7 and came off and said, well, I can't really be disappointed with that because that is the best you could humanly play in a match and lose. So... They've both got some history with the Crucible. Four visits for Dave, nine for Fergal. But Fergal hasn't been there for six years. And Dave's bidding for his fifth and would love the chance to secure a second victory. The only win of his four visits so far was that first round win over Martin Gould in 2012. But this continues to be one of those deciding frames that uh, seems to have quite a lot of mileage still in it. Still a few in watching these games. People that really care about the game here in Ponds Forge, some of whom no doubt will be popping down to the Crucible at some point over the next 17 days from Saturday to, to see a session or two, season ticket holders, a few of those that they pay a lot of money, the season ticket holders. Speaking to a chap last night who's a regular, I think he paid out £5,000 for next year. A lot of money, isn't it? I thought they were phasing the season tickets out. Yeah, they, they phased them back in again, <laughs> I think. They've allowed people to go. Anyway, I know that um chap paid £5,000. John, who's uh, somebody that you will have seen at the Crucible, actually, whether you knew, knew his name or not, but he's he's always there. Which ones? Is he the older Australian guy with the tie? Oh, hang on, now that's David. No, no, it's a chap called John who's with uh, Ian Burns, but you'll know him. There's a lot of faces at the Crucible you know, isn't there? You go back, then you see the same face. Yeah, on. especially down that front row. I feel sorry for them, actually, sometimes, because you sit there and, or you stand there and, yeah, you try and have a bit of banter with the crowd and, and vary the chat and talk about the, the match and the context, what it means for that player. But with 51 intros to do over 17 days, there's only so many ways you can skin a cat. And I feel a bit guilty a few times. I see the those who are doing every single session sitting there finding the chit chat uh, a little bit tedious so uh, I do feel sorry for them but if you're in there 51 times you're going to hear the same material a couple of times over well the in off was untimely because he left a red on here as well now if he can get up onto a colour it will be a half decent chance no pink and black are tied up Well, he's played it quite sensibly to come down the table, so to target the green ball is his way of staying in position. Nedalina, the Italian lady who's been sending us quite a few tweets, said she's moving to Scotland next year, so she'll be able to do a bit more snooker in the flesh. The British tournaments 
in the next 12 months. So good for you. Warren Pilkington clarifies. He says, John is a banker from Manchester. He's the Man City fan. Front row. I know exactly who you mean now. Minky says, please, no skinning of cats. Figure of speech, Minky. No offence, men. So. Big moments here for Fergal O'Brien and Dave Gilbert. Dave Gilbert's had his hair cut for the occasion, streamlined and ready here at Ponds Forge. And they must be feeling it, these two. Dave actually had that walkover, Patrick Wallace experiencing a bereavement in the family and then beat Reese Clark 10-6. This is Fergal's second 10-9 in a row, having beaten Tian Peng Fei very late on Monday night. Well, Tuesday morning, really, half past two. But he's bounced back brilliantly today, Fergal O'Brien, from 6-3 overnight. I think he would have taken that at the start of today if someone had said you'd be the very last match on and you'll be nine apiece. Turn this into a brilliant contest. Are we destined to go deep into the colours? Remember, Black Ball decided the match for Peter Ebden against Michael Holt this last twist of drama before tomorrow's draw at 10 o'clock with all 32 names it's not easy this for Dave Gilbert Dave Ford overseeing this one Yes, a lot of people are asking uh, who that referee is. Yeah, Dave Ford, incorrect. Mm, it was Far Jaw. A few people asking me whether uh, there's any news on whether Ken Doherty or Jimmy White will receive uh, wild cards or go to Q score. I don't know, actually. I, when I do know, I'll let you know on that one. Apologies to Nedalina. She's Bulgarian rather than Italian. She's the one who was saying she's going to move to Scotland and come to a few more tournaments. Cosmin from Romania says he had his first, he or she, apologies, not absolutely certain there. Cosmin had a first live experience at the Crucible last year and wants to come back again. You would be most welcome. Fifty one still on here, so there's plenty of room for further drama in this match. That red to middle right just hit the far jaw and came straight back for Dave Gilbert. He was just a little bit too close to this cushion to see his way round the black to get the Red that's currently 
closest to the bottom right-hand corner. It's a chance, this, for Fergal. Oh, but it was a difficult one. Nervous moments for both of them. Yes, it's a horrible frame of snooker, the way it's gone, but the rewards are so great. I mean, the, the ranking points you get, well the, uh, of course, they count a, a pound a point as such. As uh, Gilbert knocks in that red. To get to the Crucible, you're on 16 grand. And if you're a qualifier, that's 16,000 counts towards your ranking. If you're a top 16 player, you get the money, but you don't get the points because you haven't played a match yet. So you've got to get a round two for your points to count. Round two losers receive 25,000. Quarter final is 37,500. You get to the semis, you're really on the big bucks. 75 grand, 160,000 for the runner up, and 375,000 for the winner. That's a lot of money and a lot of ranking points. That's huge, isn't it? And when you say, is it is it next year or the year after? So by 19, or is it next year? Either next year or the year after, the winner of the world championship will get 500 grand. It's one of the next two years. If it's 18, I'd love a piece of that inflation. 375 to 500 for half a million pounds. That really is a big prize. I mean, 375 is not shabby, but you know what I mean. Well, it, 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 the problem is, I know not to look on the black side of it, because whichever way you look at it, it's very good. But you've got Stuart Bingham in a position this year where he loses all those points at the end of the championship. Now, OK, it's better to have them in the first place. You know, you can't look at a ring donut and, and sort of look at the hole in the middle and be sad it's, there's a hole in the middle. You've got to look at the donut, haven't you? But um, I'm just making the point that, you know, he's got a lot of points to lose. Mercifully for Stuart, he won the, the Welsh Open recently. So uh, he's got a few back. But even then... The other interesting thing, and Phil Yates rang me very excitedly to tell me this the other day, right out of the blue, and he said to me, well, you do realise that even if well, whoever wins the world title, if, if Selby was to lose first match and his nearest rival went on to win the 375,000, he'd still be world number one. Cause he's got so many points in hand. And he's almost got to have the most horrific season next year imaginable and he'd still end up world number one at the end of it. He's so consistent, isn't he's he? miles clear, isn't he? Saw so the uh, s spectators still in there. Sorry to interrupt you there, Rob. Still have quite a few spectators in. I guess the argument about the World Championship prize money going up so much so quickly is that potentially, and I mean, we're only hypothesizing here, maybe, I'm not saying I subscribe to this argument, I'm just saying somebody might say that, that it almost makes the rankings a bit lopsided. But if that's the prize and it's and it's the biggest thing in the sport you can win, if you win it, you deserve to then be miles clear as world number one if the 500 grand gets you there. Meanwhile, Gilbert misses a blue to the bottom pocket and what's happened now is that he'll be snookered in behind the pink almost certainly. Yeah, just to finish your point though, I think it, if it, you could either say it, it makes it lopsided or it rewards winners. And it certainly does that. Tournament winners get the most points. Probably how it should be. For too many years we've had people accumulating points for consistency who haven't won anything. Well, Gilbert, that was a bad mistake from David Gilbert. And he's put himself in an awkward snooker now because he's got to go straight onto that right cushion. And that sometimes you, you can never be certain of the way it's going to throw off the cushion. It will depend on the pace of the shot and all of that.
Fergal clearly feeling less fatigued today than he was yesterday when he trailed 6-3. But that half-two finish Monday night stroke Tuesday morning has got to be coming back to him now. This is exactly the same as Ebden in the sense that Ebden came through two deciders in the second and third qualifying rounds and, and that is what Fergal is currently experiencing. He's got to be feeling tired, surely. I can't believe that. I mean, he, he looked, that wasn't even a snooker. He directly got to it. I mean, he, look, he probably is tired, Rob, but I tell you right now, I don't think at this point in the match, I don't think tiredness is going to be the problem. I think as soon as he gets off the table, should he win, he'll be exhausted tomorrow. But I think right now he's probably running on adrenaline. You can do that out there. But he probably is quite weary. And if your mind gets tired, that's when you struggle. You can't think straight. I mean, I, I cannot believe that wasn't a snooker. He looked like a difficult one to hit, and he hit it directly. I think at first, Gilbert was thinking he'd play out of a snooker, then discovered he could see it. Played it well. I, I suspect he'll be in a bit of trouble on his next shot. Again, there could be a part of the red sticking out here. Just looking up to see Fergal's progress to the quarters in 2000. He beat Chris Small in the first round, 10-8. Then he beat Stephen Lee, 13-8. And found himself on the wrong end of a defeat to Mark Williams. 13-5 in the quarterfinals. That was the year that Mark went on to beat Matthew Stevens in the final. Because remember, Mark made the final in 99 and lost. And then won in 2000 and won in 2003. So a long time since Fergal has gone deep at the World Championship. Even longer since he played his debut in 94. Can he get there again and make it 10 crucible appearances so far in his career? Well, he's been on this shot an awfully long time. An awfully long time looking at this. And now he's come back down again for a third look. And he played McManus on his debut in 94. Lost to Alan 10-7. Well, he's now settled down to play the shot at last. No, he's not. He's changed his mind again. This is about the fifth time he's done this. Now he's walking down the table. He's, he's come down this table around five times here. And the balls have not moved. I'm afraid it wasn't worth the wait. He's got away with one there, though. The red could have gone over the middle bag.
Yes, yeah, he was a bit lucky there. Don't think Dave Gilbert will be taking quite as long over his shot selection here. The very last exchanges of drama over Judgment Day. Needed a bit more to put that cue ball in a more awkward position. He could cut that in, Fergal. Thirty-five still on. Only trails by ten. Matt Seltz sent me a tweet, or he sent a tweet, not to me, just generally putting it out there, that he thinks that maybe one or two of the last shots have been taken too long to be played. Difficult one, I know. Listen, I know what you mean, uh, Matt, but Fergal uh, had a long, hard look. Listen, this is the, the, the real business end of a match, but I take your point. I think sometimes what I would say is that players don't realise how long they're taking. They're not doing it deliberately. Certainly, Fergal isn't. It's an amazing angle, isn't it? Because it looked as if he could cut that in, didn't it? I, I'm amazed that he, he couldn't. I think sometimes it can be quite deceptive. Yeah, it looks as though a thin contact would... Uh, would see that last red go. So this is it. Just one place left in tomorrow's draw. We really appreciate your company online over the last couple of days. Which of these two men is going to be the first to make a mistake? Well, in this, I just said, Ryan Kerr's asked me who, what were the, were the results from the EBSA playoffs today? I don't know. I know that one of them was won by Peter Lyons, I'm told. I don't know who won the other one. I need to find that out, actually. So we can get someone out there to let us know who won those. Because they've got this tour place up for grabs. Well, apparently, uh, Sean Murphy's put a tweet out. Him sitting in front of the TV in his pad, just taking in the dying embers of the drama of Judgment Day. I'm sure he'll be tuning in to uh, see who he's drawn against tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Could it possibly be one of the five debutants? Gary Wilson, Yan Bing Tiao. David Grace, Yorkshire's very own. Zhou Yuo Long or Nopon Xiangkam. Five men in the mix at the Crucible for the very first time. Well, we'll see. But mm -hmm. good, uh, good to have the, uh, the magician along for a bit of company towards the end of our coverage. Just on that, uh, the uh, playoffs today, um, thanks to everyone that's got in touch with me. <laughs> It's not exactly the youth of the game. I'm pleased for them both. Peter Lyons, great guy, and another great guy, Gerard Green.
back on the tour. I mean, those are old stages, and uh, they're back on. So great f to see them do it. In a way, it's a shame there's not some more young talent coming through, but hey, they won the matches. I don't entirely know how, how those players were arrived at, but I'll say well done to all the people who are involved. And Gerard, I'm sure, was devastated 12 months ago in this very building, losing in the in the very dark, small hours to Peter Ebden to, to, put, to take him off the tour. And a year on, he gets back on, so congrats to him. Anyway... Fergal O'Brien now five behind. I mentioned someone actually said to me that I think it was Jan, tennis expert, said be glad you missed Fergal in the decided versus Tian Penfei walked around the table five times for several shots at two AM. <laughs> I wasn't here, I was in bed mercifully. Yeah, I was fast asleep after at that time of night as well. Storing up, my storing up my energy for, for these two days. Yeah, from a, a sea of tweets saying Gerard Green. Thanks to everyone that sent that those. I did see that they were taking place, but I, we've been in this... I'd have had a look at them, but we've been in, in the commentary all day. So we haven't really been able to see any of that stuff. Th th when we're in this commentary, it, it, there could be anything happening in the world, couldn't it? And we, we would be oblivious to it. Yeah, I, th I think because we finished, I'd done most of my notes this morning in the hotel room, but I had a few little top-ups to do on my sheets for the evening matches. And I probably, we had around, what, 45 minutes between the two matches. So we have physically been in the booth, other than when we've gone for a comfort break or ordering our curry. We've probably been sitting here for, well, what is it now? It's, uh, yeah, pr probably close to 12 hours. So, obviously, Tom Ford will be happy enough. Atletico Madrid won Leicester City nil. Gives them the chance back at home to reach the semi-finals, I guess. One nil is not the end of the world. No away goal, but they're in there. In there with hope. Thanks to everyone who's been sending Rod and myself nice messages all day because we've enjoyed it and I'm glad you've all enjoyed it too because this is really the appetizer for what's to come, isn't it, for you all? Whichever way you're going to be watching the World Championships, it, uh, of course it might be on the host broadcaster or you might be looking on Eurosport. BBC and Eurosport, of course, I'll be working for Eurosport with Jimmy White and Alan McManus is doing some and all the other commentary team, Colin Murray. And, of course, BBC's excellent coverage. Hazel Irving and the boys and, and will be there. The usual suspects. I think Peter Ebden's down to work on it, but, of course, he's playing in it. Ebden is with the BBC. So there's lots of there's lots of people covering it in different ways. And whichever way you do, hope you enjoy it. And thanks for all these really kind comments tonight. Feel free while this match is on and while Fergal walks around the table a bit more to send us a few more. We'd both be pleased to hear from you, wouldn't we, Rob? We certainly would. James, a little bit tongue-in-cheek here. It says, James Seedhouse. Like Fergal, but the amount of time he's taking to walk round the table is outrageous. So James uh, James want the, wants the baby-faced assassin or five-ton Fergal, whichever nickname you fancy, wants him to get on with it a little bit. I understand. I think he's a little bit slow now. I think he's gone too slow. But uh, it's the situation like this that brings it on. It's the context, isn't it? It's of so course, important. Context is the right word. Now, what does he do here, David Gilbert? He could. I think he could run in behind the pink, but he wants to win the frame, so he's playing the more positive shot. Fairly blind pocket. Probably can't see the opening from here. And as a consequence, he misses. Interestingly, not the black on there. That kind of frees up quite a few things. Adam Snooker Info is saying, I hope this match finishes before they do the draw. Otherwise, it'll be an either or. <laughs> <laughs> the winner of the match that's still going on. Well, they've got... What are we now? They've got... Uh 
Oh, they've got 23 hours. I think they'll make it. Not 23 hours. Surely what? Oh, I'm so tired. Sorry. You're, you're, going, you're going mad. Yeah, there, sorry. You? Sorry. No, they've got 11 hours. Uh, Tony Proctor. Yeah, interesting. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever your opinion is. James Seedhouse says, you yeah, know, I really like Fergal, but the amount of time he's taking is criminal. Tony Proctor comes back and says, nothing wrong with the Fergal uh, taking his time. It's one of, one of the biggest matches of his career in, in recent years. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, not, I'm keeping out of that one because I understand that. Lewis Perny has said that that last frame must have taken about an hour and a half against Tian Peng. I don't know how long that frame took, actually. I haven't heard anything on that one. It sounds like an absolutely soul-destroyingly long frame, doesn't it? Harry Broughton said he can take as much as time as he wants. Well, he can't, actually. That's not really correct, is it? You can't just take as much time as you want. But I, t I know he didn't quite mean it that way, but he can't really do that because it means you could take four hours on this shot. But... <laughs> Well, maybe even the score lines of the last two matches to finish in the respective sessions here on Judgment Day just underline how important it is. Ebden, Holt, all the way to the black deciding frame. And here we are in the evening session. Same case, all other seven matches done and dusted. They're on the colours separated by just five points for this one last space in the draw for the 40th anniversary edition of the World Championship. And every edition of the Worlds is special. I'm sure all the ones you were part of are great memories for you, Neil. But there's no denying, with an opportunity here, that number 40 here, the 40th anniversary at the Crucible, this is going to be special. Fergal wants to be a part of it, and he's got a half a chance. Just uh, Matt Selt saying it was 90 minutes, the Tian frame. That's grisly stuff, Matt, isn't it? And Snooker Valerie, briefly before this shot. Hello to Valerie. Fogel may be slow, but you would know that Gilbert doesn't want a time clock. Well, I know what, I know what Valerie means. She's talking about an incident that took place at, in, in the shootout at Watford where um, Zhao Gudong, he ran out of time and wasn't penalised. These things happen, I know. But uh, you make a good joke there. This clearance, if he makes it, will take some getting. Blue to pink's going to be monstrously difficult. He's missed it. Can't remember what time this frame started, actually. I totally understand this is taking a while because the, the prize is massive. Not just the money, it's, it's not about the four grand difference, is it, between last round of the qualifiers and first round at the crucible it's it's the prestige it's everything it's the climax of the season i can't remember how long ago this started are we are we over half an hour now 40 minutes well it's been a long frame uh, well rory was in wasn't he when uh, when this frame was on and he's been gone ages he was in the, speaking with you an interesting one from josh bailey and the big one, well, he actually asked about the, the qualifiers, who's going to be the best and which one go furthest. It wasn't the one. What I was going to say is, we'll see that shot. Someone says here, Ant, and he says, Fergal's in danger of overthinking things, not positive enough. Well, there you are. That's the other side. Maybe he's too slow for his own good. Never mind everyone else's good. That's that's his view, not mine. I think he may be onto something. Well, Mr. CRF... Whoever you are, he says, um, I'm watching the final match on Judgment Day, really enjoying it. Can you give my son a mention? He's watching it as well. James Bradley. Wow, James. It's quarter to 11, big boy. He must have had special dispensation 
to stay up late or maybe you did what my mum did for me in 1984 when I wanted to watch Coe against Cram in the final of the 1500. I went to bed first and my mum came and woke me up for the race. So maybe you had a couple of hours and your dad's come and woken you up for this deciding frame. If you've been up all the way through at the age of six and you're still going at quarter to 11, top work. Just to mention that uh, Jake has said that Fergal's decided Monday took an hour and 32 minutes. Fergal averaged one minute per shop. I think they mean shot. Um, this frame is approaching 70 minutes. A minute a shot, I'm afraid, for anybody. And I'll get on great with Fergal. A minute a shot is too long. Sorry, it's too long. Uh, to be fair, though, I, I'm... I'm trying not to get involved in this debate as to whether people are taking too long or not. I don't really feel it's my place to comment. But I would just put this in for the mix, just to float this out there. I was quite surprised when you just said that. Because the context and the drama is quite absorbing, it has not felt like it's been nearly 70 minutes sitting here. I thought it was more like 45 or 50. Just... That's because you've lost all track of time, Rob. <laughs> That's what it is. Okay, okay. Now, listen, I, I, I accept all of that, and I'm, I'm pleased. Whoever wins it, wins it. And, you know, I've been involved in a few of these sort of matches myself. This is, means the world to Fergal O'Brien, but the p point I'm now going to say is, is it actually helping him? That's the next question. I don't know if it is, because he, he looked at that long yellow for a long time, and the more you look at those shots, sometimes the more you look at those the more reasons you can think of to miss it. Anyway. I wonder if that frame against Jiang Fenpei was the qualifier's longest frame record because sometime in the last uh, 36 hours, you had a little look in the almanac and it was the Selby Fu fame, fame, sorry, the Selby Foo frame last year set the record, didn't it, for the longest frame at the Crucible? And wasn't that 70-something plus change? Well, the longest frame ever, McManus is involved. He's, he's, up, he's up to his neck in it, isn't he? He's involved in uh, a frame with um, Pinches, Barry Pinches, which, which went on for about 96 minutes or something. Football match with a bit of Fergie time on the end. OK, so we're not, we're, not, we're not even close yet. But I wonder how many matches, there can't be too many frames that have gone on longer than this one not too many well, in I the qualifiers goodness me he's not the black in the middle that is a huge error wow is it a free ball well that shot defies belief i don't know whether i'm not sure whether we're able to see that shot again but either way it was an extraordinary pot to the middle bag and it's not a free ball as far as I can see Twitter's gone absolutely ballistic hasn't it yeah it, it really has I mean, the, yeah, there's, there's, there's so much chat about the length of time this frame is taking. Ben Sizer says, you've got to feel that tiredness is taking over for Fergal at the moment. Ben Sizer, I know, comes to the Masters tall lad. Quite a good player, youngster. Yeah, people are people are quite vocal about the length of time this frame is taking. Well, Joe Perry's saying he can't actually watch Fergal anymore. He's saying a ridiculous amount of time. But uh, that's my point. He's saying something I agree with, and I'm talking about well, no no favourites in this game. We're by, uh, unbiased. Um, he's saying he's actually doing his own head in, and I think that's right. Stuart Bingham and Michael Holt are watching. hope you're enjoying. Obviously, Michael, goodness me. Uh, less said about this afternoon the better no one feels worse than you how on earth did you lose that match mate anyway eyes down for Benidorm and the wedding yes, yes. Have, a said, have a great summer the word carnage came into it you said earlier on didn't you Captain Carnage will be on the flight with Halty I suspect 
What goes on tour stays on tour, Michael. Just remember that. Barry pinches us. Come on, it was 100 minutes. The frame with... Sorry, we did you an injustice. I only said 97, Barry. You and Alan. That's your record, and surely you want someone to beat it, don't you? Anyway, and I hope you're well, Barry. That's only 23 minutes shorter than the marathon world record. 100 minutes. <laughs> it's also 24 seconds on the end. There you go. Someone saying re -rack. No, don't think so. It's it's funny, isn't it, that, you know, it, it the length of time that this frame is taking is generating an awful lot of debate here. And it's good in a way because it shows there's a lot of people watching it. Yes, that 100-minute frame, someone else has messaged me. It was in the Ruhr Open. Um, Rory won that one, actually. And the McManus Barry pinches 10th. Of October. Where were you when that frame took place? Well, I certainly wasn't in Ruhr watching it. Thank goodness. 100 minutes and 24 seconds. Barry pinches. Who's a great guy. It's not a criticism, of course, of Barry. And far from it. And Angles. I reckon it was Angles' fault. He probably... It was probably his fault. He's probably not listening either, so we can say that. Well, I predicted 11 o'clock... I'm going to be out here. I, I think we're still going at 11. We will get an interview if, if, you, if you're amongst the hardcore and you want to find out which one of these two guys is in the hat with the 31 others tomorrow. We will get a winning interview. We won't try and doorstop the loser. Yeah, so just uh, just a reminder, as we are taking a little while, let's just give you a, a quick rundown. Luca Bressel joins the top 16 in the draw tomorrow. 10-5 over Dominic Dale. One appearance in the Crucible before when he lost 10-5 uh, to Stephen Maguire. Peter Ebden, well, the less said about the match against Michael Holt, if Holt he is watching. Ebden's in it for the 24th time. Debut 25 years ago. Xiao Guo Dong beat Mark King 10-4. Remember, he was overnight 8-1. And Mark won a couple of frames at the start of the session today. Gary Wilson will make his debut at the age of 31. 10-3 over Michael White. Yan Bing Chow, the 17-year-old, will be the second youngest player ever to appear at the Crucible. He's in the draw tomorrow after beating Alexander Ursland Bakker 10-4. Gould beat Udalu 10-7. David Grace, amazing David Grace, Yorkshire's very own. He beat Akani Sunny, 10-3. And Jimmy Robertson, a few tears in the eyes as he was contemplating going home and giving his young son a hug and telling him he was back at the Crucible for a third effort. Remember, he lost 10-1 against Selby a few years ago and didn't feel he did himself justice. 10-6 against Fu, a little better. Hoping for third time lucky. Those were the qualifiers from this afternoon. And then this evening, Stephen Maguire was, uh, was first over the line, 10-5, against Lee Hang. Then came Graham Dot, a great 10-8 win over Jamie Jones. Third across the line was Tom Ford, 10-8 against Hossein Vafai. And then came Stuart Carrington, 10-7. He was 8-4 up against Mark Williams, 8-7, but got over the line against the man who calls himself the Welsh has-been. Nothing of the sort, of course. He made the final in China and pushed Mark Selby quite close. Nopon Sankam, well, what a comeback against Lee Walker. 6-3 down, he won 10-8. To make his debut, Zhao Yuo Long got across the line against Ben Wollaston. Rory McLeod 10-7 against Hamad Mir. And then one of these two guys. And that will complete the 16 qualifiers to join the top guys in the world in the hat tomorrow. Well, the two bags of balls, to be literally accurate. And then it'll be Barry Hearn and the grinder to pull those balls out tomorrow at 10 o'clock and tell us who plays who. In the meantime, we missed a couple of shots only there. One each. The snooker escape, the, the sort of not very 
Um, adventurous safety shot from Fogel, just trying to keep the yellow safe, and then that. So the cube will be cleaned. A guy called Michael saying, have you thought about a second career as a fortune teller, having predicted 11 p.m.? Uh, Michael, his name is. Michael, not over yet, matey. So, still ongoing. What, what, what do you reckon we are now? We were, we were drifting across 70. Got to be 75 now. What, minutes? Yes, yeah. oh, it's, this is long. This is getting serious now. This is Barry Pinches is probably getting a bit twitchy. <laughs> <laughs> the world record holder. Apparently, the camera's on us. So it's a, it's a bit of a snooker version of goggle box there, I think. Anyway. Oh, this is quite funny. This is funny. A guy, well, I'm assuming this is a guy. The picture is of a bloke. I'm watching in Pakistan. 3 a.m. Come on, O'Brien. Have some mercy. <laughs> so he's past his bedtime. Joe Perry's now saying about you know cricket teams getting fined for slow over rates. It's uh, like I, I get every everyone's point on this. Barry Pinch is saying, I think that record could go and Fogel could get a, a spot on Strictly Come Dancing after this much waltzing around the table. A similar one, which is quite funny, and I mentioned that, ooh. Uh, ooh, I mentioned that um, Barry's longest frame is only about 22, just under 23 minutes shy of the marathon world record. Gavin Hugill says, Fogel's probably walked the distance of the London Marathon around the table tonight. 26.2. Well, actually, I do, I do, I think years ago they did have a, a referee, might have been dear old Len Ganley, might have worn a, a pedometer around the table, and you'll be amazed how far the referees walk during a match. I reckon he has walked a lot. I wouldn't like to say it's 26 miles. I mean, that's taking it a bit far, but he reckon he's had a good old walk today. But Sam Davis has put a tweet saying, Despite this frame being so very long, he wants to see who wins it, and people do. Debbie Diamond has said it may be slow, but have to watch it to the end. It could finish by 11.15. It may do. It may not. And the midwife, I don't know if it's actually a real midwife, says, well, why does Fergal need to walk around the table for every shot? Anyway, th this is the game. I'm just reading out these tweets. and not getting too involved in this. And Gary Lees, who played in the World Seniors last year. Hope you're well. Great commentary, guys. Can't be some late night snooker. Well, you're going to see plenty of that at the Crucible. Down the road, up the hill, turn left, and then on the right. Yeah, maybe I, I, I've got one here from Josh Cooper who says, You can't beat late night snooker drama. Let's hope there's more to come over the next two weeks. We, we'd all echo that one. 17 days. Easter Saturday, the big start. I'm going to buy some, I'm going to buy some, uh, some little Easter eggs for, um, and look out for any kids in the crowd on Easter Sunday, Neil. I'd forgotten I'd done that a few years ago. Just a few little packets of, of mini eggs and so on for any, any kids who are in on Sunday morning. Really important, I think, with the youngsters who, who come to the Crucible for the first time. It's really important that they have a great experience and, and they go home thinking, wow, I, I want to go back to that because that's... Uh, you get a seven or eight year old in and, and he or she has a great time and goes home or maybe has a little opportunity to to walk down the stairs and do a dummy walk on or whatever. Well, this is the behind the scenes, what's going on there. And there is uh, quite a bit. There's a studio. I'm going to wave from the commentary box now uh, like, like people aren't meant to do. We're waving. Yes, hello. Everyone's going mad. I think we're allowed to do this when we, when we get in towards 80 minutes or yes. so. Yeah, someone, but, someone sent me a message saying, and I don't know, I mean, how can I know the answer to this? Do they think that Stephen Maguire is drunk yet? He said he was going to get drunk, didn't he? That was his words, and I'd, we, I mean, we can't know, but I'd say he's probably having a go. Well, 
I, I, I'd say that there's, there's a fairly large capacity there. So I, I'd say it's, it's a, it's a steady, it's a steady, um, a steady sale. Yeah, I mean, who knows whether he is, but he said that he's going to go and get drunk, and that was his words. So we're not saying anything libelous or slanderous, are we? That's his, what he said. No, I... off to get drunk, and why not celebrate? Get into the crucible again. I think he's fired up after coming through the qualifiers. Yeah, I think so. And just to finish off what I was saying earlier, when we had the shots outside, yeah, I'm going to do some some um, some little Easter eggs on on Sunday for the kids who who come in. It's really important. You get a six or seven year old come in, and if they have a good time, they're more likely to you know th- those are the people who will be coming to snooker long after we've gone when they're 50, 60 and 70 and that's what the sport needs. So when the youngsters come, it's really important that they have a good time and that they feel they're welcomed into the fold. Good work, Rob. Listen, Bingham, we need to keep you in tip-top shape, ready for an attack on the title once again. He's I asked if he can have some Easter eggs, isn't he? I think You, you can the, have a mini egg. You can have a mini egg. Well, actually, probably owe, probably owe you a mini egg after um, you were you were very uh, generous with your time after you won the Welsh. What a great final that was yeah. between Stuart and Judd. It was a cracking, it's know, a I've great s- event. The Welsh. I've said this a few times about Stuart, and I interviewed him a lot last year when he was world champion, and and there wasn't one time when he didn't do everything that was asked of him. And sometimes it was to climb up a ladder and do an interview on a roof somewhere, and all of these things he did, and. Uh, it was all new to him because he'd never been world champion before. And everything he did, he did one morning where they filmed us having breakfast. I think it was up in Clendid, no? He, he, it was all, he, everything that was asked him as world champion he did. I have a lot of admiration for that. I'm not saying other world champions haven't done the same. But, it, you know, it, it, he was a good champion, was Stuart. Didn't, didn't have much success on the table during that year. So to win the Welsh, I thought was great rewards for that. I was pleased for him. Yeah, it was a brilliant win. I thought he was a little bit emotional uh, and you know justifiably so when he when he won that one it was um it was really tight that match against Judd and yeah a few people still talk about oh you know Stuart Bingham came through 16 days but did he fluke it and you think hang on a minute you you tot up the people he beat you know he beat every it. beat everybody you cannot fluke the world title impossible you can get one maybe fortunate result nobody's ever fluked that world title i, I actually um, i've never won it but i would defend everyone that's won it it's, there's no fluke about that I, th- I think off the top of my head I think he might have beaten Dot in the second round a three time finalist then he beats Ronnie then he beats Judd and then he beats Sean Murphy who was arguably playing the best snooker we'd seen from him in a long time he was on fire and the script could have been written there because of course Alex Higgins did two titles, 72 and 82, and Sean had done 05, and a few people were saying, wow, you know, 10 years on, is he going to get the second? Stuart Bingham was superb value for that world title. So, you know, anybody who who, who was in that small minority saying that he'd fluked it, it's... Uh, nonsense. It's crazy. Nonsense. Um, just to say, uh, Snooker Valley has asked me to mention one thing again. The World Snooker Championship is to be broadcast throughout the Americas and the Indian subcontinent uh, live on Facebook. So that's worth hearing again. That's all correct. So we've done that, Valerie, and rightly so. Andy Orange said he's one hour ahead, working in the morning, already one hour late. One late night, sorry, with um, the Masters this week, watching um, Sergio win his first Masters. That was, I was up watching that as well. It's tremendous. <laughs> Oh dear! Sorry, some of these messages that are coming through are um, people are going mad, aren't they? It is nuts. There's some quite funny ones here, and I, you know, I, it is a little bit amusing. Warren Pilkington says we're up to 85 minutes, and still the yellow's on the table. Right, let, th- this one's tickled me a little bit. Uh, cluster of reds. I'm not sure who that is. I'd love to see O'Sullivan's reaction if he draws O'Brien, and ends up getting in a decider. Nicky Buckingham says, is that a male or female Nicky? Either way, it's Nicky. Nicky says, if Fergal draws Ronnie, I reckon Ronnie might shave his head again, like he had done when he played uh, Peter Ebden. Ebden. Matthew Brannigan says it's only 3 p.m. in San Diego. He doesn't care how long it goes on for because he's not going to bed because it's the afternoon. 
And it's a carbon copy of Fergal's game with Mathlin two years ago. He lost 10-9. Lula says it's a pity, as they could both be qualifiers, that we can't see an Ebton O'Brien clash in the first round. It's not a pity. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Esme Willis says, I'm being forced to watch Late Night Snooker with my fiancé, Byron. However, I'm very much enjoying the commentary. Thank you for that, Esme. How long have they been on the yellow, by the way? Does anyone know that? Because it seems to be on the table. When was the, when was the time, the last, last pot, we want to know? No. Mark Breslin saying, he's got to go to bed. Let me know who wins. Come on, Mark. Athar says, take your point about inspiring kids, Rob, but how are kids supposed to be inspired by this? Well, look, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's a massive prize for these guys. But, yeah, it does feel as though the yellow's been on the table for a long time. Well, it has. Sean Murphy says, it's OK, though. We definitely, absolutely, 100% do not need a shot clock. TikTok, hashtag. But uh, I know he's been, you know, it's... Sarcastic there, and I know Sean's listen. Sean's got very strong views, and he's been very much entitled to those. Don't agree with everything he says. Certainly not to open up the worlds to the extent, but you know he's got views, and there's nothing. And I like that. I can't sit on the fence. He believes a shot clock should come in, and uh, times like this, it is hard to argue against. Ah, uh, so listen. Let's let's get across the 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 potential record here. Is the Barry Pinch's record under threat? I'm just looking, I'm asking our technical guys here just outside the box to give us a precise duration so far. Are we approaching the Barry Pinch's 100 minutes? We can't be a million miles off. I've had a, I've had actually a message from Mark Selby tonight and uh, he sent me a text and it says, this is from current world champion Mark Selby. Fergal's shoes will, will need re-soiling. Uh, so, <laughs> soling, I think. Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 that was my misreading of it. Re we know what you meant. We know what you meant. <laughs> A trip to the cobblers. Y yeah, that's right. The amount of laps he's done around the table. All right. And what? the yellow's gone anyway. Well, Warren Pilkington said they were on the yellow for half an hour. Yeah, and now it's gone. In the blink of an eye, it's gone. And we miss it, the yellow. We are going to get a definitive time on this uh, frame. So, look at that. Nine apiece, 46 each. Five balls left on the table. And only room for one of these two men to regrace the famous carpet. Remember, the angry farmer who will be supported by the Tamworth Massive if he gets there. He's bidding for a fifth appearance at the Crucible, debut ten years ago. Fabulous Fergal, five-ton Fergal, babyface assassin Fergal, whatever you want to call him. Made his debut back in 94. And he's bidding for a 10th appearance at the Crucible, 17 years after he made the quarters in 2000. Well, we're trying to find out if the records have been broken. We're a bit worried the man who might know that might have gone. Um, we've gone to find out whether this, this is, must be getting close to 100 minutes now. Well... People might have some very strong opinions about shot clocks and the length of time this match is taking, but they're talking about it and Twitter's going mad. So people are watching it. Twitter is going ballistic. But we, we're enjoying it. Mike Dunn's been on. <laughs> he said, we've just done a Mexican wave in my house when the yellow went down. Ah, how about this? Sammy says, I just rewound Eurosport player. The last red was potted at 25 to 11. There was over half an hour between pots. Well, that's, yeah, that's on the yellow. What about the rest of the frame? 
he hasn't rewound it that far yet. OK, here's here's a question then, Neil, from, from the point of view of someone who, who's been out there, probably not contesting a frame over this duration. I'm sure you had a couple of long ones. At what point, if if you said, at the very least, you could say that O'Brien is a slower player than Dave Gilbert, as such, at what point will it become difficult for Dave Gilbert to concentrate with the amount of time the latter stages of this frame is now taking? I don't know. I think he'd probably be all right. I think at this point, if you're not concentrating now, then you're in trouble, aren't you, this late in the match? But this frame commenced at 21.35 and 57 seconds, apparently. So this that means it's um, 96 or something minutes long in my just a rough, crude calculation without even having a proper look. And he's missed that. So we are close to the... Would this be the unequivocal world record of the longest frame in snooker history? Insofar as records have been taken, or can we not be that definitive? I don't know. Um, I think... Found up Norris McGuirt or somebody, I think, although he's passed away, hasn't he? But um, it's, it's a, it could be a world, world record. We this don't is, know yet. This is where we need the likes of a Hendon or a Yates or a Matt Hurt. Actually, that's a good point. There's we people. Could, we there's, could text there are Matt. People. There are people in very dark rooms who know all those answers. Well, we're in a dark room, actually. We don't know. Joe Perry wants a re rack No, Joe, don't be silly. Please. That's just being stupid. We don't want that. Nicky Buckingham says new carpet required at Ponds Falls. The other one's worn out. Now back to the serious matters. This is this is at uh, the point where Fergal can get a serious edge here. He's got the free ball. I'd he probably like. Well, now hang on a minute. Is he not? I thought he might try and screw back up the table and get the snooker because while the greens where it is I don't know if how much of an advantage he can gain I'm not too sure about that shot I don't know what the, the, the snooker people out there would say yeah, so we are just confirming what the tweets have been saying that we're closing in on the world record Barry Pinches has sent me a tweet he said that frame the world record was all Angle's fault. He missed a black off the spot and blocked the pocket. Stop blaming me for the 100-minute frame. It was all the Angle's. This is an important shot here, Rob. This is uh, this is one of those where you could hit the wrong ball. He's hit the blue again. He's in trouble here. He's in trouble. Now, somebody's gone to the toilet as well. Well, I mean, obviously, you're going to frame this long. So they've both... Now, what are we going to do? They're both gone. We'll carry on. Let's get some tweets going, shall we? Yeah. Does this count? Daj Towley says, Longest frame in snooker history involved Mitchell Mann a few years ago, question mark. I'm sure it was 104 no. minutes and 32 seconds. Well, I don't know, but that's a new one. That's that's something I don't know about. Daj, have you have you dragged that one up from the... Have you dragged that one up from the... Uh, from what? The bowels of yeah. snooker history. Sam Davis says, if Fergal wins, his walk-on music should be I Would Walk 500 Miles by the Proclaimers. Now, that is brilliant. Well, the problem is David Gilbert's in a lot of trouble because he's in a pretty nasty snooker. And I think we're um, we're waiting for both players to reappear. It's extraordinary. I, I mean, at this, I think the clock gets stopped for all of this, so we can't even add this on. Yeah. So nobody gets anything out of this. Dave Hendon sent me a message, a text message, saying there's only one word to describe this, evil. Shake Tayab. Martin says, you two should order your breakfast. It will probably just be down before you move across and do the draw. Oh, so. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. There's so many tweets coming in uh, about this match. This has been our home.
uh, for the last two days. We're in a we're in a little corner here. So long that we could have had a little pet goldfish or something. Could we have our own pet in this room? Yeah, we do have to apologise. We haven't cleared up from the curry. We haven't had a chance to to step out. This is our little box. It's um. Seriously, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun, actually, hasn't it, Neil? We, it's been a very, very long... Uh, well, just I was looking over my shoulder. They're still not back. Uh, it's been a, a very long couple of days, but, you know, it's you've performed at the highest level. You, you've gone there automatically, and you've also come through to qualifiers. It's so important for those of us who, who like the sport to remember the prize that's at stake. I mean, it is a lot of fun that we're, that we're having and a little bit of banter about the fact that this frame is going on incredibly long, but... It's it's the it's what these guys dream of for all those years. So you know, Ebden and Holty going all the way to the to the black this afternoon. This is obviously incredibly long tonight and longer than we could have ever possibly imagined. But the prize is immense. All the, after all the banter's gone, one of them will be in the draw tomorrow, and it will mean a lot to them. Yeah, and Fergal's had a few very big disappointments. He lost a respot a couple of years ago. He's had a lot of last frame matches that have gone against him and I think that shows because he has got very slow I and mean, he really has the game has ground to a halt um, and that might be you know one of the reasons it's gone the way it has a few interesting things have been said someone said surely the the longest frame record would have been in the, the Thorburn Griffiths match in 83 that finished at nearly 4 a.m. 3.51 in the morning but that's not true Now, um, the, the the problem he's got here is this is a pretty rotten snooker. Now, the, the world record, I hope that the world record that stands doesn't include that time that was stopped there because I don't think that applies, those couple of minutes toilet break. But anyway, for the moment, more relevant to all of that is this is the, I mean, <laughs> I hate to say this, but where does the mistral fit into this? I mean... He's not got a, a clear shot at this green anyway, and I hope that there are circumstances by where he could miss this and not be called for a miss because this is a horrible snooker to be in. It's it's nasty. And now Fergal's shot looks like to be the right one, putting the, the pink a little awkward. It's a really horrible snooker. And how's he going to hit it? I think if you played this game at amateur level, what you'd do or in, in, a, in a local league, mate, you hit this about 500 miles an hour, so nobody knew which ball was hit first. Well, I think I think that was all right, wasn't it? That Was that legal? I, I don't know. I, I think was it he, was. Mm, did he did he glance the... Was it marginal? It was so... It's so hard to tell without being able to see a replay. This is what I'm saying. You hit it as hard as you can if you're an amateur and... and now, that's a bit of controversy. I think Fergal's unsure. I don't know if we, there's any way we could ever get to see that again. Or whether we can hear the referee's microphone. Apparently, they're not wearing microphones uh, well, on I think that we table. Th we want to see the shot again, don't we? The referee's obviously not called a foul. So, the referee's, what he says is no, not relevant now. We want to know about the shot, I think. I don't think it was a foul, personally. I think he hit. I think the referees called it correctly. I think he hit the green first. I'm not entirely sure. Mark King says blue first. It was tight. It was really tight. We are trying to rewind that and play it back to you. Obviously, this isn't the same as the number of cameras that we'd have on a traditional full OB. And we'll try and show you that one again. There's a few opinions coming like in about that. I'd like to see it that. again. I have to say, I, let's, no, let's see this. I think that was green first. I, I asked to... Let, I wonder if we could see it another time. I'd really like to see that again. Or I think that was a good that was a good angle. I believe that was green first. Or can you slow it down? I'm just asking the guys outside if they can slow this down a fraction. I think that's the blue. It's so close. Yes, I'm not sure now. And that now is 
the record. Now, I tell you what, I wonder if we could see that a third time. Fergal's at the table, so he's not going to play a shot anytime soon. I wonder if we could see that again. I think that was absolutely fascinating. It, it, you can watch this and call it both ways. I, my instinct was it was by the merest fraction blue first, and yours is the other way round. Well, I'm not so sure now. Let's have another look. Oof. Yeah, I think I'm starting to change my mind. I think it was blue first. Well, and of course, if it was a simultaneous hit between green and blue, that's also a foul. Simultaneous is a foul as well. It was very, very close. Well, it's a difficult one. Listen, I wouldn't blame the referee for that. That was too difficult. It goes in the category too difficult for me. I wouldn't blame him if he got that wrong. That was a hard one. One thing we can unequivocally say, it's a world record. We are now watching, according to all the, we've got a few people still here running around to check. This is what we're being told. This is the longest frame in the history of the modern game. And we still have five balls on the table. Midnight? Well, people are saying that uh, here it is again. Uh, no, that's a little bit too. If we could just take that back and see it a bit slower than that. I mean, that's the problem. We've got the chance to see it in slow motion, the slowest of slow motion. And here it is again now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, people are saying it's blue first. I think they're all correct. I changed my mind on that. But you. Yeah, I guess we've got to. You've got to remember the referee is having to judge it with his naked eye. And when he's been standing there for hours and hours and hours trying to do the best job he can. No, it's a tough. that was a tough one. And anyway. he can't see the replays, can he? So No. Right. No, it could be significant. Somebody's watching from Norway. Loving the excitement and the nerves late into the night. People are, people are saying that maybe the referee was standing in the wrong place. Is it the wrong end of the table? I don't know. wouldn't know. Couldn't, I didn't see where the referee was. Not wanting to, to give anyone a hard time on that. Because that I think that was a difficult decision, personally. And so the green's in. So we're getting somewhere. I wonder if we can have a little in between shots if we can see how many people are still in whether we have any cameras remember this isn't the same as a full OB that you'll be enjoying from Saturday onwards Jake Hayworth said he reckoned it was about 20 minutes between yellow and green being potted so we're saying blue on that and I'm um, feeling a little sorry for for everyone really um, David Gilbert's finished on the right side of a decision. Of course, he got a bad one in the shootout that cost him. Fergal, well, and I feel bad for the referee. I think it was. I honestly think that was a tough one. I really do. Well, I suppose you know that the, the moment's gone, and well, it has. It is it, what it is. It has gone. But I tell you, that was a that was a brutally hard snooker to hit. There was only a bit of the green sticking out. There's every chance that match could have been over on that shot alone because it could have kept being put back. I don't even think that should have been called a miss. I mean, I don't know what would have happened if it had been called a foul. There's people here. <laughs> I thought you were going to come out with the famous <laughs> World Cup line. People on the pitch, they think it's all over. Well, I wonder how many people out there realise they've witnessed a world record. Look where the other balls are on the table. This 14-point lead's huge. This this could end up a two hour frame. Yeah, quite a few people are saying Gilbert deserved a little bit of luck after what happened at the shootout. 
Dan writes in and asks, have we left the EU yet? Yes, my dad's uh, text me, he's have to go to bed. He's not been so well, my dad, and uh, he says he doesn't want to get ill again. I won't go into the details of it, but uh, he said he's he's got to go to bed. So he's not watching the, the end of it. He's going to be taking the dog out in the morning for some for a walk of some description, I think. Barry Pinches has sent me another tweet saying, I can't believe my record's gone. I'll be trying even harder to get on tour so I can have another crack at 110 minutes. I can't believe, honestly, we, we, we have enjoyed so much drama over the last two days and we've had some interesting tweets coming in but we have never had as many tweets. I mean, I don't have a giant amount of followers. And my, what is it, the notification section is updating constantly with people tweeting about this frame. Yes, it's, uh, it's got people very interested. And if, if the angry farmer can knock this in, it would, it would certainly help matters. Because, oh dear, oh. it's just not happening for him, is it? Well, he's, you know, I asked you this earlier, and, uh, you know, I know these guys are professional, but they've got to be shattered. Three best of 19s. I know Dave had a walkover with the, you know, the personal tragedy with Patrick Wallace. Reese Clark, 10-6. It's, what is it, it's coming up to half past 11. Gilbert's got to be tired. And so too Fergal. When you bear in mind that Fergal was here till half two, Monday night stroke Tuesday morning. The fatigue has got to be, got to be playing a, uh, 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 playing a role here. Well, that was an extremely good shot, and uh, there's more problems here. Fergal has actually played some good shots on these colours. Now, there shouldn't be a miss called if he if he doesn't make contact this time. Because there'll be 22 in it if it's a four-point penalty. That won't be called as a miss. People are saying marriages have lasted less time than we've been in this commentary box. Now here's a very important shot here, Rob. This this could be match over if this doesn't work out. It's a very difficult snooker that he's in. He could the cue ball could go straight into the top right pocket if he's not careful here. So this is the shot of the night. He's played it absolutely magnificently. That is brilliant. Look at where he's left the cue ball as well. That is just a brilliant shot. A brilliant shot. He looked in all sorts of trouble there. That was absolutely superb. When you bear in mind how long this frame has been going and how tired he must be mentally, that was sensational. Yeah, I mean, he really he couldn't have played that any better. People are saying, give these guys some credit. Dominic James Brown, let's give these guys credit. There's been some granite safety. 
the numbers on Facebook have gone up and up. It's unbelievable how long this frame is. People are watching this. It's tremendous. That was absolutely brilliant, that shot. Tony Pollock saying Gilbert did not play the escape on the brown like that. Well, what do you think he played exactly? I think he played it exactly like that, personally. If he didn't play that, what could he have played? The only other thing would have been to, to play the pot it. I think he played it just like that. Warwick Snooker Club have just sent in an amusing tweet saying, Rob, has anybody there got a pound coin for the table light? Well, since we've been in here, there's a different pound coin in circulation, actually. <laughs> All our money is no longer valid. It's all out of date, everything. I don't know, we, we might get to see that shot again, I'm thinking. I think that is exactly what he played. A gentleman, Tony Proctor, who has got a view, fair enough. Uh, we're not going to fall out over it. I, 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 he thinks he didn't play that shot on the brown. I think it's exactly what he played. Here it is. I think he played it a round of two, three cushions like this. I think that's exactly what he played. I wonder if any of the, the other snooker pros watching would give me their view on that shot. I think it was a brilliant shot. One or two people think it was lucky. I think it was one of the best escapes out of snooker I've seen for a long, long time. Kingy out there, Joe Perry, Pinches, Selt, if you're watching, Mr. Murphy, Stuart Bingham, anyone else I've forgotten, Mike Dunn. Let me know what you think of that shot. I think he played it out of this world. It looked like a, you know, I'm... Nowhere near as educated as you, Neil. It looked like an absolutely sensational shot, bearing in mind the fatigue that he would be experiencing. Um, Alex Aboyle, Aboyle says, um, one hour on the colours alone, lads. Imagine that. Well, just It is extraordinary, and that was, I think, a stunning shot. So let's see what, what people are saying. Hit and hope, says Tony Proctor. I don't know. I think it was a great shot. He played it definitely, says Jamie O'Neill. He's a snooker player. Selt says it was a great shot, no question. Thanks, Matthew. Matt Selt, I, I I do think it was a brilliant shot. And Gareth Allen, Gaz Allen, hope you well. Different gravy that escape. Yep. Sean Murphy is saying something. Uh, what is Sean saying? Definitely played it. Great shot. I completely agree. No, Gary yeah. Lees, he knows the game. He's a player. He said he played it. Mark Allen. Good evening to Mark Allen. Didn't know you were watching, Mark. Definitely played it. Awesome escape. Absolutely stunning shot. Stunning shot. He was in... I thought that the, there was the most likely outcome of that shot was the cue balls to go straight in the pocket because you're almost playing in the session area that you go in the middle of it. Holty, he should have got the brown tight to the black rail. Bad <laughs> shot. He's joking. He knows it was a great shot. And then we've got um, Mike Dunn. I think he called it bang on. He played it. To be honest, he hit it great. That's Mike Dunn. Snooker professional. No, Tony Proctor says he's wrong then. No, it's his opinion. It's fine. The midwife thinks he played it, hit it directly off one cushion. I don't know. I think it was a wonderful shot. Well, in the context, in the context of the match, it must, you know, it must be getting hard to concentrate when the frames gone an hour on the colours alone. I thought that was absolutely phenomenal. Lee P has sent the message, what a time to be alive. That sounds like a, a sarcasm. Some Somebody, it, I can't tell whether this is male or female, Steph, prob well, yeah, could, do they know I have an exam tomorrow? Please tell them I'm in Montenegro. So they're watching in all sorts of corners of the world. Tell you, I had one from Bob Harris, an old friend of mine from many years ago. I hope you're well, Bob, down in Portsmouth. He says he couldn't have played it like that because the in-off was on. I think he means he played it the way that he, he got. Chris Lincoln says, have we gone past the marathon record yet? I can tell you the marathon world record is held by Dennis Cometo, 202.57 from Berlin a couple of years ago. So if we get close to... Um, if we get close to two hours, then, then 2.02.57 becomes a possibility. we got to... Lewis is out there waiting for this... In, in fact, he's fallen asleep. 
our social media guru just closed his eyes temporarily there. I think he was just um, daydreaming with his eyes open. Uh, we need to keep our eye out here to see if we get close to 202.57. Dennis Cometo's marathon world record over 26.2. Warren says we're hitting the two-hour mark now. Well, I think we are. I mean, obviously, there was that toilet break. Does that count or not? No, that's not included. Right, OK. So the headline is, I've now had so many um, uh, notifications coming through, I've, I've lost the name of the person who asked the question. But 202.57 is the answer. OK, well, in the meantime, we turn our attentions to the table again because this is a very important shot here from... David Gilbert, does he try? He's in his. He's, uh, he's got the point now where it means almost too much to these guys, where they're almost frightened to play any shots. I understand that. I know the game, and I know that you sometimes feel like that. You know, it it starts to. Um, oh! No, but he's got the. the there's a. There's a. A good side to it, isn't there? Yeah, he got the snooker. Well, I think I think that we could be one shot away from this match ending here. So we even though we're hitting two hours of this match. This is even more trouble than the previous that he's in here. He is in absolutely shredsville here. If he misses this, it won't be a miss, but it won't matter about that. Let's see how he goes. Has he hit it? Oh, he's... Oh, I, 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 I'm speechless. I'm speechless. He's played it brilliantly. How he's not potted it, I'll never know. I'll never know how that didn't go in. Fraz and James both separately say hello. Fraz says he's been watching for hours. That is so tough there on Dave Gilbert. This is not a scenario where you want to be doing a, an interview with a, a losing player. No, and... Um of course, this is frame ball, match ball. I don't know if we've passed two hours now. Have we of play? Because that is an absolutely humongously long frame, if it is. A two-hour frame of snooker. Goodness me. Well, Fergal now has got the point where David Gilbert needs a snooker. Now... I wonder if they know how long this frame's lasted. The great, the great world final of 85 was a over an hour long frame and neither Dennis Taylor nor Steve Davis realised it was that long. Oh yes, well that's it now. Well it's going to be Fergal O'Brien. He's he's got there. This was the shot that's uh, made all the difference, and this was the the shot where he hit the made very good contact with the brown, but didn't go in. Handshakes all round. It's over, and Fergal O'Brien is the last man through. A frame lasting two hours in duration. It's a world record in snooker, but it's Fergal O'Brien, the Irishman, who's through. Congratulations to him. We're going to get Fergal in, but we want him to hurry up, and he he might not be all that uh, all that quick on his feet now. But he's won the match, and if we have time, we haven't got very long. We might get Rob to have a chat with him, but it's going to have to be a quick one. Someone's going to have to collar him and get him in here. So wow. that's an extraordinary frame, Snooker. Thanks to everyone that's got involved tonight, and thanks to all the players. You know, we've got former world champions, top sixteen players. Hundred and what was the So it's not a two hour frame. Hundred and nineteen minutes forty seconds. We didn't even get our two hour frame. I feel a little bit cheated by that. Well, it's uh, it's a record that hopefully for the sake of anybody else watching a really long frame will stand 
for quite a few years, but it was extraordinary. We, we thought we were heading for a cheeky pint at about quarter past ten, and the, all the other matches finished, but um, not to be. And it's Fergal who advances. He is the last name from the two days of qualifiers to make it through to tomorrow's draw.